Hola, muy buenas tardes. Eh, hemos retomado la conexión. Ahora estamos con Aaron Benanaf, es un prolífico autor de Estados Unidos también, ahora mismo residente en, en Alemania, donde está formando parte del equipo de investigación de la Universidad eh, Humboldt. Eh, Aaron es un escritor y un investigador que se ha dedicado a indagar en los pormenores del trabajo y la automatización, pero desde una particular y muy crítica perspectiva. Eh, centrado en la cuestión del desempleo, que tiene que ver el desempleo, la automatización y el trabajo. Eh, bueno, pues sin más preámbulos voy a dar paso a nuestro compañero Aaron. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Aaron. This is a place and an honor. Uh, we have been following your work uh, closely. Um, we loved your within your articles in the New Life Review. Um, passionate debates you've triggered with them. Quite interesting. So. The stage is yours. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to just uh, share some slides with you and talk through some of my findings on automation. And then I'm very excited to talk uh, more specifically about the Spanish case and to think about what all of this means localized um, in Spain. So I'm just going to try to share now my screen and we will see uh, if this works. Great. Oh, did it work? Can you see that or no? I can see that, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay, sure? perfect. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, automation and the future of work as well as the global pandemic economy. These are obviously big topics, um, especially thinking about labor and labor strategy in the present in 2020 and looking forward to the future. Um, even now in the midst of the crisis and awaiting a vaccine, we're told that automation, which has been supposedly going on at an accelerating pace for years, we've been told that it is now Uh, unfolding even more quickly in the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Here you see a, um, a check-in robot at a um, hospital in Antwerp. Um, and, you know, around the pandemic as well, we've seen companies that use digital technologies Uh, growing very rapidly at the expense of, you know, smaller shops and, and, and in-person stores. Um, in the United States, there was a big protest around this figure, Christian Smalls, who was a worker at an Amazon warehouse who complained about a lack of protective equipment and was fired by the company. Um, so some would say, you know, these kinds of struggles of workers and warehouses are, as it were, obsolete. These workers are simply going to be replaced with machines. That's a claim that people make that I'm going to contest in my account of what's happening. So what I'm writing about is a new, uh, new for a number of years now, conversation or uh, discourse, as I call it, about automation. Um, many books are coming out every year about this topic, claiming in essence that um, there are many people losing their jobs and that the main cause of this job loss is technological change, automation, um, you know, industrial robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, there are trends that make this argument you know, that support this argument. There are trends that, that the theorists of automation can point to as part of their claim. What I'm showing you here is a tendency that people call um, jobless recoveries in the United States. So there's a pattern where decade by decade, uh, it takes longer and longer for the labor market to recover after a recession. So this is taken as evidence of a decline in the demand for labor. Another uh, way to think about this 
is just that there have been, in the U.S. case again, um, though we could talk about other cases, higher rates of unemployment on average uh, since um, the 1970s. Um, so higher rates and longer time to recover means in general, workers are having a more difficult time finding and securing jobs. Now, because workers are having so much trouble finding and securing jobs and winning increases in their wages, we've seen an incredible uh, concentration of income among the very wealthy. And of course, here you see um, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos from uh, Tesla and Amazon. They've made untold billions of dollars during the Corona crisis and they've been spending a lot of their money trying to escape to Mars, you know, to invest in um, uh, um, um, spaceships and rockets so they can get off the planet. So in my book, Automation in the Future of Work, I contest the narrative of these automation um, theorists. And I, I think that there's a very strong case to be made that workers for the past half century, more or less, have experienced a really intense decline in the demand for their labor. But I do not believe that automation is the main explanation for why workers have so much trouble finding jobs, why workers' bargaining power is declining, why they have so much less autonomy in work and are so much more subject to the commands of their employers. So when I, where I start off in my argument is I look at manufacturing for a few reasons. One is that manufacturing is a part of the economy where it's very easy to see the extent of um, the adoption of robotics. You can really see how much automation has taken place. This is just a standard statistic of, you know, which countries are most ahead in this process of introducing industrial robots. It's how many robots they have per 10,000 workers. Something interesting about this is that the United States is actually not one of the leaders of the pack. It's really countries like South Korea, Singapore, Japan, Germany, and Sweden that are at the forefront of um, automation technologies. The other reason to look at um, manufacturing is that manufacturing is a sector of the economy where the jobs apocalypse has already taken place. So many of the new claims about the automation discourse are focused on services because that's where most people work today. But the claim, those are claims about the future. The claims about the past, the evidence for this claim comes mostly from industry. And we see here waves of deindustrialization affecting the wealthiest countries, medium income countries, and even poorer countries in the world economy. Uh, and this deindustrialization hasn't only affected countries like Spain, Italy, the United States, UK, and so on. It's even afflicted uh, China and India, which have seen declines more recently in the share of their workforce in manufacturing. Now, in order to evaluate the causes of this deindustrialization, I look at some basic economic statistics. And what I want to show is that the, this pattern of global deindustrialization is not due to a radical transformation in uh, computer and digital technologies. It has a longer history and a different cause. So um, what I wanna show you here briefly is uh, just the basic evidence. So what I look at, first of all, are the US, Germany, and Japan, which are the most advanced um, it, you know, industrial countries in the world, the, the, the richest and the most industrially uh, powerhouse countries among the advanced capitalist countries. And you can see that since, um, these are just three periods for the USA, Germany, and Japan. Uh, we're gonna talk about output, productivity, and employment. These are three um, metrics for, for um, looking at changes over time and in, in what's happening in the industrial economy. And what you can see is 
it used to be the case that industrial employment gr was growing. So more and more workers were in manufacturing in the 1950s and 60s. Since the 70s, we've seen a decline. And in um, at least the US and Japan, this decline has accelerated over time. It's much worse in recent decades compared to the 80s and 90s. Um, but what you can see in this next column is that it's not the case that there has been an acceleration in productivity growth rates in industry. So if there really were a radical takeoff in new digital technologies, we would expect really rapid productivity growth because the workers who remain employed would seem to be producing more and more as their coworkers are being ejected from the system. It's true that in the US, um, productivity growth rates look relatively stable. There are reasons to doubt that that have to do with measurement issues in the United States, which I would be happy to talk about. But if you look at Germany and Japan, what you can see is a significant decline in the rate of growth of productivity. And remember from earlier, I showed you that Germany and Japan actually have significantly more robots per manufacturing worker than the United States and the UK, for example. So in spite of having more industrial robots, we see this trend of decline in productivity growth rates in Germany and Japan. So what is the explanation then for why uh, employment is falling at a rapid pace in these countries. My argument is that the real cause is a decline in the rate of growth of output. That is to say, essentially, the, um, the rate at which industry expands in these countries, the rate of expansion of industrial production. What we see in country after country is a significant decline in the rate of growth of output. There's a slight exception in the case of Germany, which has done very well in the last 20 years in international markets. But for the most part, in country after country, we see this stagnationary trend in an industry. And in fact, this may be a little hard to explain across the language barrier, but uh, these statistics go together. You could see that in each case, output minus productivity equals employment in terms of growth rates. So, um, yeah, we could, we could talk about that in more detail, but there's a connection here. And what the evidence shows is that it's really the decline in output growth, the stagnation of the industrial economy, not the rise in uh, productivity growth that explains this trend of deindustrialization. Um, now, just to, to kind of telescope some of the arguments here to go through it more quickly, my own accelerating pace, um, I argue that it's not only in these very rich countries, it's actually a trend across the world, the stagnation of industrial output. It's due to an increasing overcapacity, overproduction and intensified competition in industrial markets across the world. We can talk about that more. I think it's, you know, it's a debatable thesis. It's one that I'm constantly discussing with other um, scholars, friends and activists. Um, but the important point here is that as this trend in manufacturing has unfolded, the same trend has unfolded in the economy as a whole. So here are those same three countries. MVA is just output growth in industry. Uh, and GDP is the economic growth rate for the economy as a whole. So we're comparing, as it were, kind of like the economic growth rate in manufacturing to the economic growth rate of the whole economy. And what you see is that as manufacturing has dropped off and stagnated, so has the economy as a whole. Uh, and in fact, in most cases, the stagnation in GDP, in some cases, the stagnation in GDP is more significant than the stagnation in uh, manufacturing. So we have a significant drop off in growth rates. And this, uh, this mirrors what's happening in the wider economy. This is just for the, econ the same kind of statistics for productivity, as I showed you before for manufacturing, here for the economy as a whole. You don't see any trend towards rising rates of productivity growth. In fact, just as in manufacturing for the economy as a whole, you see a significant drop off in rates of productivity growth. 
Um, so these economies are, are becoming product, more productive at a slower and slower pace, not a rising pace as you'd expect from the automation theory. And this corresponds, I argue, to a decline in rates of investment in the economy. Essentially, as we hit this point of overproduction and industry is declining, the growth engine of industry, there's been no replacement for the growth industry, for the growth engine of the manufacturing part of the economy. And what we see is a real drop off in rates of investment. The growth of the capital stock is like capital accumulation. The rate of accumulation has declined. Now, you might have heard or seen news that COVID-19, as I mentioned earlier, accelerated the pace of uh, automation across the economy. Um, in fact, what we see, this is the, the growth of the capital stocks, particularly in the United States, is that the decade up to uh, the COVID crisis actually saw the worst stagnation of any decade since um, World War II in terms of capital accumulation. So in terms of investment in new plant and equipment, in robots, all of that stuff, the 2010s were the worst decade for it. We saw the least of it. And so the idea that it was accelerating then and now it's gonna pick up pace now is clearly false. It's just not true. Um, and in fact, even if you read the World Bank or these other kinds of you know, very cheerleading capitalist um, uh, um, you know, institutions, you'll see that they believe that the effect of the COVID crisis will be an even worse stagnation of the economy in the sense that they believe that now we'll see even less investment on average going into the 2020s. So they expect an even worse condition uh, to follow, not an accelerating trend toward automation. So what's really happening? As these economies are stagnating, uh, we've seen a real shift in government strategy, which I'm sure everyone is very familiar with. Um, the uh, um, uh, governments in the United States, but also across Europe and in much of the world have decided to um, put this stagnation on the backs of workers to say to workers, you know, look, the economy isn't growing as fast. Unemployment rates are high. Uh, we need you guys to get back to work. And the way we're going to get you back to work is we're going to take away your protections and your benefits and force you to take whatever jobs are available. Um, apologies, this, and, um, we can't see the slides, so I think it's not working. Oh. Uh, I think you should stop and start the game, maybe. Okay. There you go. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me see. Hold on. Uh, okay. There. Can you see that? Does it? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Let's go. Thank you. Okay. Great. So, um, so what, uh, in any case, what the um, governments have done is they forced workers to bear the brunt of it. And so even as we see this stagnation trend, what you see in this slide is that across the OECD, um, so not just the US and UK, but Spain and a whole range of other uh, European and wealthy East Asian countries, we see this increasing divergence between the growth of wages, especially for poor workers, and the growth of productivity. So as the economy stagnates, um, workers are made to bear the brunt of it and uh, elite incomes are preserved at the expense of um, uh, workers' incomes. Now, you know, this trend will no doubt, um, let's see here. This trend will no doubt continue into the future that is to say that in the 2020s, I'm sure that governments will in general try to um, uh, make workers bear the brunt again of an increasing stagnation trend, blame workers for um, uh, uh, rigidities in the economy and say that they have to uh, make even more sacrifices in order to get the economy going again. And it, you know, in many ways, it looks very bleak. Um, and this kind of bleak future is presented across so much science fiction and, um, you know, uh, apocalyptic film. 
here, you know, just an example, the, the Brazilian um, uh, uh, television series, the 3% about, you know, uh, uh, favela, people in the favelas competing to join the, uh, the, the, the elite. Um, now, I don't think we should settle for this kind of terrible future. And one of the reasons why I'm so interested in the automation theorists is not only to prove that their account is wrong, but really to, um, to think about the positive potentials that they themselves claim. They're talking about the advent of a post-scarcity economy, an economy where work is no longer the center of social life, where automation frees people to um, follow their dreams and their passions. And in many ways, I think that there's something really exciting about that vision of post-scarcity, an attempt to think beyond the current institutions of our society in a very radical way. Um, in my view, the problem with the automation story is first of all, that it sees the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the forces leading towards this post-scarcity economy primarily in terms of technology rather than social institutions. And they see the, uh, the work of producing these technologies and getting us to post-scarcity largely as a role for entrepreneurs, right? They see it as something that scientists and capitalist entrepreneurs are going to develop. And it doesn't really need our participation in order to get there. My claim on the contrary would be that post-scarcity is something social that we can achieve today, um, but we're not going to achieve it by letting the rich sort of, you know, accelerate us towards some beautiful future. That's clearly not happening. And in fact, something we could talk about more that I think uh, Ben was also talking about before is the way that entrepreneurs investing in digital technologies are not expecting their workers to disappear. They're investing in uh, surveillance, overwatching of their workers. Um, and, you know, a lot of, uh, very negative implications for workers of the inclusion of new digital technologies in production. If we wanna live in a different world, we're gonna need a very different set of institutions and we're going to really need to um, democratize the economy. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm really interested in talking about what that would look like, what it would mean. Um, it seems to me that uh, thinking about UBI is not enough it's very interesting proposals for universal basic income because these proposals uh, suggest, you know, a new way of um, reviving the old welfare state on new terms of uh, giving people direct access to money that they can use to buy things, to support themselves. Um, to me, the uh, UBI won't solve the fundamental problems because the same stagnation will have the same implications for UBI as it does for the welfare state more generally. That is to say, slowing growth and zero-sum games, zero-sum struggles between capital and labor, uh, unless there's some real transformation in the organization of the economy, workers are gonna end up losing at that level. And so I guess what I think we need is we need to think about um, how to use digital technologies and how to democratize the economy and how to use digital technologies to support the democratization of the economy. And fundamentally what that's going to mean is transforming, not just um, making uh, workers' lives better, which is really important. Um, and I am very supportive of any changes that improve the bargaining position of workers, their capacity to struggle um, both their capacity to meet their own needs and to struggle against, um, you know, their bosses for improved working conditions and higher wages. But in the context of a stagnationary trend, we're going to need to do more. We're going to have to attack the power of capital to uh, control the rate of growth of the economy and to decide where investment goes and how much that investment grows or shrinks the economy. Democratizing investment is, in my view, uh, a really crucial way to think about what it would mean to democratize the economy. And that's going to have to require that we figure out how to use digital technologies to um, create a world in which workers can coordinate with one another and make very big plans for um, 
for uh, how the productive apparatus of the economy is going to change. I think that's going to be an incredibly difficult, if not impossible, thing to do in a single country. Um, and so it's going to require a much broader struggle in which I think um, uh, uh, an idea or a vision, a shared account of how a post-scarcity economy is possible, how it could become the basis for fighting against climate change by guaranteeing everyone access to the things that they need to live, for overcoming all different forms of non or extra economic uh, domination and violence around issues of race and gender and uh, cross country imperialism. So I think we need to build a rebuild a positive account of, um, uh, of, a, of a post scarcity or socialist or communist future. Um, and that, yeah, this, the, the automation account is not going to be the one that will get us there. So that's just some brief thoughts about it. But again, I just want to leave a lot of time for questions. So I'm going to stop there and hopefully we can have an interesting conversation. Thank you very much for your exciting talk. Um, I was wondering, you are now living in the heartland of the so-called Industry 4.0. Is there any difference in this ideology driving behind since there with the Industry 4.0? Is there anything changing? Is there anything new mm. about this industry or is it just discourse and rhetoric? Yeah, I would say that in my view, it's mostly a discourse and rhetoric. It doesn't mean that um, uh, there, there certainly are um, efforts to bring digital technologies and the internet of things into uh, industry in Germany and in other countries. Um, but it's very wrong to think that those technologies are gonna lead to a re-centralization of industrial production in Germany or in the US that it's going to lead to reshoring of industry. Uh, it mostly seems to me to be continuing trends that already exist in the economy. Um, and on that issue, I would highly recommend the work of Florian Botalo, who's written extensively about um, the kind of limits and myth of industry 4.0, particularly in Germany. Yeah, um, I have another question. Uh, I've been following your talks in Dish Machine Kills and I think in uh, Technology Won't Save Us. And I was quite interested about your take on science fiction and how science fiction can actually illustrate and bring us some ideas to reverse this ongoing process. And I would love to hear more about that and if you could serve uh, a little bit of this. Great, yeah, I mean, I think that reading, I, I do it partially out of my own experience and I don't know what the experience of others is. I, I kind of get the sense from many of my friends in the US that everyone is also pretty depressed in a lot of ways. And uh, about, you know, there's, there's a lot of catastrophism, there's a lot of defeat, experiences of defeat, and um, it's very hard to see the way towards a positive future. And that's what, one of the reasons why I think it's so important to engage with science fiction literature, because I think that even when, you know, they don't exactly explain how it would work, um, science fiction novels give us a view on, you know, human potentials beyond uh, a capitalist society. And so um, I, I've highly recommended uh, texts that even, you know, people in the automation world are excited about, like um, the Culture series by Ian M. Banks, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's utopian novels are very interesting. Um, and I think oftentimes, you know, obviously um, those novels are very exciting and, 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 and unrealizable in many ways, but I think that in, in some ways they provide a really important contrast to um, some of the socialist literature that's focused on what we can do immediately that often to me seems a bit gray in terms of its implications. Like 
they're sort of, you know, they're interested in work security and um, the end of the profit-based economy, but they're not interested in the, you know, there's less of that exciting depiction of what it would mean to live in a world where people really didn't have to worry about having a career um, and making money to survive and all the kinds of incredible things that human beings would do once they were freed from those, um, those necessities. Yeah, I love this, this notes and um, I'm really excited of meeting someone who actually with those two. Um, I was wondering, okay, how can we leverage these utopian ambitions of an alternative futures with the ongoing everyday life struggles for, for instance, the ones that just happened in California with regards to the Prop 22 and, and so on, how, how we can leverage this long horizon and the everyday battles with, for instance, with some legal protection for workers and, and so on. What is the myth path between those two visions? Yeah. I mean, it's really tough. I, I think that, you know, one implication of what I'm working on is to say, let's resist the, um, the kind of uh, hype of the automation discourse. It is incredibly important for workers to understand that their jobs are, you know, um, they're not going to just disappear due to technologies and they have to fight as hard as possible against the trend of our times, which is, um, capitalists fighting to um, separate workers from one another, to uh, to you know surveil them and make it more difficult for them to organize, and especially in Europe to expand the categories of workers who are legally disadvantaged. Well, I, I just I guess to finish the point, I would just say that it's very important to continue these struggles um, and at the same time to try to connect them to a vision of an actually transformed economy, um, the possibilities of, uh, you know, getting beyond the capitalist economy, which, which isn't going to be possible just as a result of struggling to improve workers' conditions. That's a real limit of, um, of, of those kind of struggles. And the point is not to say these are the limits. The point is to come up with a vision of transformation that those struggles could connect to um, and, and, and presenting the case, which I think that we haven't really done enough of just yet. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, have you, do you have the chance to read uh, a critical article uh, of your work in publishing Jacobine, I think by Keen Woody? I think, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was yeah. wondering your thoughts on that critic, if you want. So. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for Kim Moody. I think that his emphasis on the transformative role of rank and file struggles in opening up possibilities for major social transformation is key. And I see myself as kind of coming out of a lot of the same traditions as uh, Kim. So I think that there's an awful lot that we agree on. Um, I think that there's, there's a certain way, you know, I'd be interested in how this looks from a kind of Spanish perspective in a certain sense. Um, it seems like part of the, the issue uh, of debate between us is that um, in Europe, there was a development of a kind of discourse and conversation and struggles around precarity, around the idea of precarious workers. And in Europe, um, workers, who are, uh, there's a real distinction between temporarily employed workers on the one hand and permanently employed workers on the other hand. Um, in general, in European countries and in Japan, permanently employed workers have major protections against firing, right? Um, and they tend to also be organized. There's a lot that defines permanent employment in um, a European and Japanese context. And what we've seen since the 1980s and especially accelerating in the 90s and 2000s are efforts on the part of European governments but also Japanese governments to encourage workers into uh, legally disadvantaged categories of temporary work, part-time work and so on where workers actually have fewer protections under those conditions and we've seen major struggles in Spain and Italy and France um, and to a lesser extent in Germany uh, 
against these reforms that have had as their goal to push workers into these um, legally disadvantaged categories. Now, this concept of precarity was then taken over into the US context, basically. And, you know, people talked about the expansion of precarity in the US, but in the US, the labor market is structured very differently. All workers can be hired and fired at will unless they have union protections or they're tenured academics. And of course, both of those categories have really significantly declined in the past uh, 30 or 40 years. So in the US context, all workers are essentially precarious in the European sense. And to my mind, um, the big issue here is that um, there's, a, there's a problem of not, in Kim's work, of not analyzing the differences in labor market institutions across the European and US contexts. So he's often very critical of the idea that temporary workers and part-time workers have expanded. Um, and that's true in the United States because capitalists don't need to expand those categories of workers to take advantage of workers' insecurities. Whereas in the rest of the world, it's really important that um, businesses focus on um, getting workers into these legally disadvantaged categories as a way to make them more insecure. That's just a brief introduction to what I see as the, the basic difference between us. It has to do with the very different structures of liberalization in the US versus the um, European, Japanese, and even global context. Uh, I think that Kim doesn't pay enough attention to those differences, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was wondering, um, we are living in a world increasingly globalized and more and more interconnected, um, heavily dependent, but also at the same time fragmented. fragmented. Um, how, how, we, how can we build alliances? Podemos construir alianzas. Extremely different interests on the struggles, for instance, I, I think for instance, the workers in the Chinese industry, white collar workers in Germany, um, the Bay Area, uh, people, uh, people working in mines in Africa. How can we build mm. solidarity among them? Is that possible? Is it even possible? In any case, I, I don't know whether it's possible. There's a lot of things we would need um, to build those kind of connections. And obviously um, building rank and file movements and organizations is a really important part of that. Um, in um, my view, again, you know, I think this is the point where Kim and I probably agree a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It's really out of the kinds of um, struggles that we're seeing unfold across the world that those kind of solidarities are going to be possible, that people form connections in and through the experience of, um, of struggles, which maybe aren't las shared struggles, but are at compartidas least, quizás, um, pero... uh, temporally simultaneous. We saw 2019 was a year of incredibly explosive um, social movements around the world. 2020 saw very big movements in the US, uh, Chile, and in other countries. And I think that once the pandemic ends, we'll probably see even more of that. That isn't to say that that automatically builds connections, but I think it's a kind of context in which um, those kinds of solidarities become possible. It's the, it's the, it's the material out of which um, those solidarities can be built. Oh, th thank you. Yeah, I lost your connection. Sorry about this mess. Sometimes happens. No problem. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's really great to, to, to be able to speak to people in Spain from the you know, comfort of my own living room. And it's certainly better for the environment. So I think we just have to you know, do our best through the technical difficulties and have those uh, kinds of- Yeah, looking forward to with your future books. We are super excited about them. If you wanna give us a glimpse of your prospect books, we'll love that. So, so do the listeners and the audience. Uh, Sure. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm working on two uh, texts right now. One is a, a history of unemployment, of the categories of unemployment and of the kind of difficulties around measuring unemployment, uh, really about the rise and fall of full employment as a policy goal of governments um, and what that looked like. 
Then I'm also really interested in a question which my book about automation raises, um, which is the question of how digital technologies can be used to build a, um, an emancipatory project in a post-scarcity economy. So I have an article coming out in uh, Logic Magazine of which Ben Tarnoff is the editor. Uh, it should be out this month. It's called How to Make a Pencil. And it's about um, something I think is really important, which is the 20th century socialist calculation debate. So a debate between the original kind of neoliberal theorists like Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek and socialists like Otto Neurath and Oscar Lange about whether socialism is possible and whether, you know, essentially information technologies, what role they would play in, um, in, in making that possible. So check out the article in Logic, I would say, and then hopefully through conversations, I'm, I'm going to try to build that into a larger book project as well. Thank you very much. Um, Great. I think you cut out there for a second, so I didn't hear that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was saying thank you very much and see you, see you soon, hopefully. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really good to see you again. Yeah.